recordings or record. Let's see. Now the the um, that that one mission during the expansion pack where you had like the one hit, the the one hit weapon, but you had no health. That was a little frustrating the first time I played it. That that was a little nerve wracking. Um, but yeah, I I'm a Zelda fan too. Um, now there, I, I'm gonna say this real quick. We'll get to class, but yeah, there's this there's this mission where you're given this weapon that will kill an enemy in one strike, but you have but you will get killed in one strike because you have no armor and you have like a quarter of a heart of health, and you have to go around and you know activate these various things, and there's enemies everywhere. It's a little nerve wracking. Okay, um, all right. Enough Zelda. Uh, hey, I had a Zelda picture in, in structural analysis when I was talking about energy method or a picture of Link. So I, I you know, of course, you know, I, I've I've got to be a fan of the series. Okay, uh, today's lecture on welds, specifically weld design. Again, if there's any design that we do this semester, this is the easiest, um, and I really mean that. I don't say that uh, flippantly. Um, because number one, there's there's like no iteration, and what we do in the um, the in the math to, for the assumptions it, again, it's it's really easy, and and all I can do is just show you it, and you'll you'll understand. Uh, let's though talk about logistics though, so everybody understands where we're at and where we're headed. Let me put on the highlighter. So today is Monday, March fifteenth. We're doing welded connection design. Okay, um, you're gonna have homework 4.2 assigned today and that's gonna be due Wednesday. Now I have to prepare the homework right after class. I didn't get a chance to do it before. So give me a few minutes to get that prepped up, but I'll have that to you um, here in the next few minutes after class is complete and that'll be due Wednesday. Now on Wednesday, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna do our exam review on Wednesday and you'll turn in homework 4.2, but we're not gonna have the exam until Monday because Friday we get, we're all canceled because of the holiday. Uh, so we won't have the exam until we get back on Monday. So when you come back, we're just gonna you know do the exam like we did last time. Um, uh, the other thing I'll mention, and I know my capstone folks are aware of this, but I'll, I'll tell you this. So we have capstone presentations on Wednesday, on, on March 17th. So we start class at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. I may be a few minutes late on Wednesday, and I'm just telling you that now so that uh, so that you're aware. Um, for those of you that aren't in Capstone, but if you are, or, uh, but if you are, you know. But if you aren't, just if I'm a few minutes late, just bear with me. I want to make sure that we get to the questions. Um, I just wanted to tell you that now. Okay, let's talk about welds. Let's talk about welded connection design. Where is my clicker? Um, but let's go ahead and get right into it. Um, first off, I want to make sure that we recall the math. Hopefully. Um, Especially now that you've done the homework assignment, you should see that the 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 math is is pretty simple. Um, the uh, the you know, for instance, the 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 weld metal capacity. All you need is the electrode strength. You need the length of the weld and the size of the weld, and boom, you know, you can compute that. It's very plug and chug. And as for base metal capacity, it's not hard. You know, you just need um, the uh, the gross area and shear and the net area and shear. But the kicker of that is, first off, the gross area in shear is just the length of the weld times the thickness of the plate in question, and the net area equals the gross area. Because in fillet welds, you're not removing material from the base metal in order to fabricate the connection. It's not like a bolted connection where you have a plate and you're drilling a hole or punching a hole through it or using a CNC to, to cut a hole. Um, it's just the plate uh, in a welded connection. So gross area in shear equals the net area in shear. It makes it pretty easy. After that, it's pretty plug and chug. Um, now, what we introduced last time, uh, which is going to play a part this time, is limitations on weld size. So remember, there were reasons for limits on the weld size uh, that were um, were not just because of strength. I think in weld land, they're <coughs> sorry, they're a bit more related to strength than they were in bolted land. So if you remember, in bolt land, we had uh, minimum bolt spacing because if the bolts got too close together, they you know, they knock around when you try to tighten them. And if they got too far apart, you'd get water in between them. That's not really related to strength, but it doesn't mean you don't have to meet it. Well, with welds, if welds get too small, we have that heat sink effect where we can get a, a, a rapidly cooled weld that can result in 
a sort of a brittle weld. Uh, and if they get too big, we start to melt the, the tip of that plate and we start to get poor weld geometry. That's a little bit more related to strength than, than with bolted connections, but it it's still not a strength concern. I mean, we evaluate strength using this, using the, the limit states. Um, but as for the minimum weld size, we look it up. As for the maximum weld size, it's either the thickness of the plate or the thickness minus the 16th. Um, and, you know, we're just going off of the weld geometry. So it's that that the, that thickness in question where we're building up that, uh, that fillet weld. Okay, any questions on this before we start talking about design? Yes, sir. Yes, that was your A. Wait, wait, ask that again. Could you ask that again? Oh, it's it's um the where it says two quarter inch inclusive. That is like if it's L by L by a quarter, you would go with the top row because the the row under it is anything over a quarter of an inch. So if your angle was, or if your shape was an L by L by a quarter, or if the plate was a quarter inch thick, you would use the top row. That's took okay. That that's okay. That's that's. I mean, it, it it is an error, but you know, it's not. You know, you can learn from it and move on. But but yeah, it, it's if your plate is a quarter inch thick, the minimum weld size is an eighth. Because two a quarter inch inclusive means including the quarter inch. Now, Mr. Romans asked the question, why are the areas, the length of the weld times the thickness of the plate, not the thickness of the weld? That's a really good question. Uh, but it's because of where we're assuming the failure to occur. So if you have, oh, let me turn my pen on. So if you have a plate, you know, that's welded right here, we're talking about the strength of the base metal. So we're talking about, you know, if here's the plate and here's the weld, we're talking about the, the metal sort of yielding like right there, right adjacent to the plate. So we're using that full thickness. That That's why. Because it's it's the, the thickness of the, the metal in question. Because it here's the thing. So so the, the limit is either shear yielding or shear fracture. So let like shear fracture, I think, is a little easier to understand. If you're fracturing, you know, the base metal, that's through the full thickness of the base metal. Like you've got to, you know, rupture that plate all the way through in order for it to fail. Does that make sense? That's a great question though. Yeah, that's a really good question. Anything else? All right. Okay, let's let's talk about welded connection design. And the crazy thing, or it's not crazy, I, I think it's, it's um, the easy thing about connection is there is no iteration with the types of connections that we're looking at. So let's go through this step by step. Okay. So the, the, oh, here I go. I've got a typo because that I uh, said bolted connection that is supposed to be welded. I will fix this and re-upload. Sorry. Okay. So the step by step process for designing a welded connection. So first off, we've got to determine the factored load. Okay. And then the next thing that we do is we choose a weld size. So we choose the, um, the A value, okay? And so we do that based off of the weld limit. So what that means is we'll take this, we'll look up an A min and A max. And then based on these, we choose an A. Now, what might be a little, um, I, I don't know, counterintuitive, is that given a range of A min and A max, given a range upon which we would select an A value, um, ultimately what we're gonna do is try and pick the largest weld size that we want, not the smallest. Um, 
the, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but the reason why is the larger the weld size, the shorter the weld length. So, the, you know, if you have a really, really tiny weld size, you need a long weld length in order to develop that capacity. Whereas if you go with a really big weld, you don't need as much of it. If you're talking about depositing weld, the more economic weld comes from the shortest weld, right? That's, that's the cheapest. So you want to keep the weld as short as possible. So to keep the weld as short as possible, you need a big weld. So we want to choose the largest size possible. And more often than not for typical simple connections, we want to choose the largest weld size possible up to 5 16 I'll talk about why 5 16 here in a bit. Um, but that's the first thing that we've got to do once we factor our load is choose a weld size. Once we get a weld size and we know what electrodes we're going to use or materials so on and so forth, we can compute the capacity. And the capacity we're computing is the capacity of a single inch of weld. So we determine how much load can a single inch withstand and then we divide to obtain the total number of inches. And once we get that, we're done. You know, we just divide to lay out the, or you know, to get the total number of inches and lay out the weld. We usually lay out the weld in a symmetric fashion. So if you need 14 inches of weld, put seven on one side, seven on another. I say usually, cause I'll probably mention one little instance where we don't do that, uh, just to, you know, broaden your, your horizons and understanding. Um, when we lay out the weld, we usually limit the weld to like the nearest inch. I've seen some folks w limit it to the nearest half inch, uh, but no more than that. I mean, either the nearest half inch or the nearest inch. For, for our purposes in CE414, we're just going to round up to the nearest inch. So if you compute that you need 6.8, just round up to 7, you know, or 7.2, just round up to 8, just round up to the nearest inch. Um, and when you're placing those welds, either put longitudinal welds or longitudinal plus transverse. No just transverse welds. That's, that's bad. That's low ductility. Means if it fails, it's going quick. Um, now, a uh, couple notes on design. In design, we typically, again, we want to choose the largest weld possible. Okay. The largest weld results in the shortest length, which means it's quicker to deposit. If it's quicker to deposit, that means it's cheaper. Okay. Um, now, a common weld size that we use for design is 5 sixteenths of an inch. The reason why is because when you're laying out a fillet weld and you're placing that fillet weld, 5 sixteenths of an inch is about the largest weld size that you can deposit with a single pass of the electrode. So for instance, if you have, um, let's say you have a plate, you know, and you're trying to deposit this, and let's say you're trying to deposit a fillet weld that's, I don't know, three quarters of an inch. That's a big fillet weld. That, that's really big. Okay, the way that that works is you're going to place that weld in a series of passes and you're going to build up that weld until you get to three quarters of an inch. So you might say, okay, I'm going to place that first bead that's, that's kind of like this. And then I might place another bead on top of that and another bead on top of that and another bead on top of that on top of that, on top of that, and so on and so forth. And you might keep doing that until you get that, you know, sort of, oh, somebody's trying to call me while I'm in class. Um, until you, and you keep um, depositing that until you get that effective throat that's like a three quarter inch weld. And so you're gonna keep building that up. Now to be clear, if you got a connection that's got a load, a lot of load on it, like you gotta do that. You know, there's 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 nothing wrong with that. Like if you need a, 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 a larger weld, use it. But it's usually, the only time you ever need welds like that big are if the loads are pretty big. Um, in most um, typical simple connections and structures, you don't need a weld that big. I mean. I would think the worst case scenario is if you design to develop the full capacity. And if you design to develop the full capacity, I mean, that's the biggest weld you would need because that weld is designed to develop the full capacity of the member. And even in those instances, for most simple connections, we don't need welds that big. Um, so, you know, more often than not, we don't need to do this. But again, a common weld size is 5 sixteenths for that reason. Now you may not be able to place a 5 16 weld because maybe your minimum weld size is 3 16 and your maximum weld size is a quarter. In that instance, go with the quarter. You know, larger weld, shorter weld length. Larger weld size, shorter weld length. 
and never ever lay out a connection with only transverse welds. It has poor performance and ductility. Any questions on this before we jump into a design example? Are you confusing me with him? Well, I tell you what. Okay, all right. Let let's talk about let's talk about homework format. Let's talk about you know how we need to start setting this stuff up. No, no. Uh, hold on. Okay, so you, you man, you you. I, I feel like you're you're changing your mind a little bit, or at least. <laughs> we need to break out the, the starting equations and everything and system parameters and hold on hold, hold on hold on hold on wait 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 um so we're gonna call this uh a and call this b right we're gonna <laughs> I noticed that 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 uh, Mr. Randolph hasn't said anything since. <laughs> I love this job. I do. Okay. <laughs> you use those Greek letters. And not the ones that are simple, like the ones like Psy, the ones that are just the squiggles, you know. Okay, um, <laughs> let's uh, let's do a, a welded connection design example to demonstrate just how easy this is. So we're going to use E70 electrodes. We're going to design a fillet weld to resist a service dead load of 15 kips and a service live load of 40 kips. Uh, we're going to assume A572 grade 50 steel for the plate. And we're gonna assume that the capacity of the gusset plate is adequate. So there's the member. The member is a six by three eighths. And so we're gonna evaluate weld metal and base metal capacity based off the member. And we're just gonna assume that the gusset plate is fine. If I gave you, you know, the thickness of the gusset plate, we could just compute another set of base metal capacity. It wouldn't make it any more difficult. Uh, and you'll see that as we, as we get into the problem. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna, um, go through and we're going to design this fillet weld start to finish and I think you're going to find it's pretty simple. So let me um, let me stop the share here. Um, find my mouse. Anybody uses like a lot of monitors. I don't know if it's just me but I'll lose my mouse pointer. Like where is it? Um, okay so there's the um, there's this. Let me stop this. Hold on. This card. Move that over here. Sorry, I'm getting my PowerPoint out of the way so I can see it too. Okay, so we're going to design this step by step, and, and I think you're going to find it's pretty simple. So start off. Let's go to step one. So, oh, wrong. I'm trying to be color coded here. So step one. We have a uh, service dead load of uh, 15 kips and a service live load of 40 kips, so we need to determine PU. So we've got P dead of 15 kips and P live of 40 kips. So therefore, PU is 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live anybody have an answer on this 82 do I have a second on that all right okay so that's step one. Okay, and now uh, step two, we need to choose a weld size. Getting ahead of myself. It's size. 
So help me out with something. Okay, so let me, where'd my mouse go? There we go. All right, so we have a minimum and a maximum. Now, first off, uh, a minimum or an a maximum are both both bleh, both based on a plate thickness. And in this problem, the plate thickness is um, three eighths. So help me out. Let's start off with amen. Can somebody in the chat tell me how we find amen? Like how do we do that for for this member? There we go. So table J2.4 and so you're getting uh, amen. Oh, man. What is going on with my mouse today? So amen is three sixteenths, and this is um, from table J two point four. Okay, and what about a max? A max is either the thickness or the thickness minus a sixteenth of an inch, and so that is going to be the thickness minus a sixteenth since we are um, greater than a uh, quarter inch. So that's 3 eighths minus a sixteenth. So 3 eighths is 6 sixteenths. 6 sixteenths minus 1 is 5 sixteenths. Um, three, so between 3 sixteenths and 5 sixteenths, what should we choose? Make sure everybody's paying attention. Five sixteenths, right? Um, we always choose a weld size that's larger as opposed to smaller, and we try and go as large as possible without going over five sixteenths. And so in this case, A max is five sixteenths. That's what we're gonna go with. So this is really one of those instances where you gotta compute the minimum and the maximum so you know what you're working with. Um, that it's it's like vitally necessary for, for what we're doing. Okay, so step three, we need to compute the capacity of, of one inch of weld. Okay. So this is based off of not just the weld metal, but the base metal, okay? So let's start laying out what we need to know. All right, so we know that the thickness is 3 eighths of an inch. We know that A is 5 sixteenths, okay? Now, um, we were told that we had E70 electrodes. What does that mean? Like, why, why does that matter? We know FEXX is 70, the electrode strength. Um, we know that um, we're dealing with um, A572 grade 50 steel. So that means Fy is something and Fu is something. And the other thing we should keep in mind, <laughs> I see that picture there, that avatar. Okay, this is 50 KSI and 65 KSI. Now, the kicker to keep in mind is that for this calculation, the length of the weld is one inch. Okay, the length of the weld is one inch because we're determining the capacity of a single inch of weld. All right, so um, while we're at it, we can say that AGV is ANV, which is three eighths times one. And so we could say that's like 0 
inches square. Just go ahead and have that done. So this calculation is going to be pretty simple. So let's do weld metal capacity. So weld metal capacity is phi 0 0.60 times our electrode strength. 0.707 LW times A. So just multiply a bunch of stuff together. So what's phi for weld metal? Boom. So 0 0.75, 0 0.6. Electrode strength's over there, that's 70. 0 0.707. This is uh, one inch. And this is 5 sixteenths. And so what's that come out to be? I'll scroll this down a bit so that I got a little bit more room if I need it. I didn't forget one, did I? 0.75 feet, 0.6. Yeah, no, that's everything. Six point nine six. Do I have a second on that? Kips. And what I like to do is I like to say kips per inch of weld. Just so I have it there, uh, maybe that's just me. I don't, I don't know. I just like to have it there, just so that I know what that is. All right, base metal, and for base metal, we're gonna have two. We're gonna have base metal yielding and base metal rupture. So I'm just gonna do each one separately. So this is phi R N is phi times 0 0.60 F Y. AGV. What is phi for base metal yielding? One. There we go. All right. So 0 0.6. Um, no, it's not 36. I'm dealing with A572 grade 50. And then this is 0 0.375. Anybody got an answer on this one? Eleven point twenty-five. Do I have a second on that? And then uh, base metal rupture. Okay, so VRN. This is FU and V. What was phi again? Yep. All right, and what do we get for this? 10.96. Second on that. Okay, so we've got three values. We've got that, that, and that. So of these, we take the worst case scenario, which in this case is gonna be this one, right? Lowest capacity. It's like the same thing with bolts. Remember how we had the 
shear capacity of a single bolt and the slip capacity of a single bolt. And when we did slip critical connections, we took the smallest of the two. Same thing here. So phi R N is 6.96 .96 kips per inch, right? Pretty simple. And think that accounts for weld metal and base metal capacity. So we don't even need to go back and check like base metal like we did with bolts where we had to go back and check bolt bearing. We've already got that accounted for here. So all we have to do, hold on, where's my, where'd my mouse go? All we've got to do is step four, compute the total number of inches of weld, right? So So we have a PU of 82 kips, and we have a VRN of 6.96 .96 kips per inch. So our required LW is just 82 divided by 6.96, and what is that? It's 11.78 inches. Do I have a second on the 11.78? Point didn't show up. All right, so, so therefore, five, As Mr. Romans uh, said, if you round that up 12 inches, we can do six inches a piece. So if you go back up here, this is your connection, right? So let's see what this looks like. So all right. And then what do we have? Five sixteenths fillet weld, six inches. I'm going to show you something here in a bit before we move on, but that's it. That's your answer. This was the um, that was six inches, and so there's your dimension. We could, we could. That's fine. Um, we could do, uh, you know, four, four, and four. That that's fine. T typically, if you were gonna do that though, like I would just weld all the way around. Like that's a really good point. So you could do like four, four, four. But if I was doing that, what I would do is I'd take the, you know, my 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 stick weld and I'd start at one end and go all the way around. So it would probably look m maybe something a little bit more like this. And so this would be six and three and three. And I probably wouldn't do that because if I did that, that would be like a really big transverse weld and some really tiny longitudinal welds. And the structural engineer in me says, mm, that doesn't look well from a ductility standpoint. So I probably wouldn't do that. But if you've got some room, you could put a longitude or a transverse weld on there to sort of shorten up the, um, shorten up the welds a bit. Does anybody have any questions? Because I want to show you something before we call it for the day. All right, I just want to show you something so that you're aware of this maybe in the future. You can find this a lot in 
uh, bridge engineering land. Uh, you can find it a lot in practice with, with fatigue. But I want to do a note on a note on balanced welds. And so let me explain what a balanced weld is. What we just did up here, this right here, this is a balanced weld. Okay, here's why. So if I have a plate, this where is the centroid of that plate? Well, it's like right there, right? It's right down the middle. So if it's right down the middle, right, and, and here's, you know, like here's my plate, right? And the centroid runs, you know, right down the middle. Then placing half the weld here and sort of half the weld there doing like this. Like that makes sense, right? The analogy I can think of is if I had a beam and I had a load right down the middle, then the reactions would be P over 2, P over 2. Like, does that make sense? That's why I put half the weld on one side and half the weld on the other. That's a, I think that makes sense logically. Everybody with me so far? Okay, now, the question is, what about an angle? Okay, so what about, what about an angle? Okay, or if I looked at it, you know, like this, then I would have, you know, that, but then this would be, that little leg sticking up, right? Like this part right there is that little leg sticking up. All right. Now, where is the centroid on an angle? Well, the centroid on an angle is not in the middle, right? The centroid on an angle is like there. It's closer to one side. So if we just some rough numbers just to have some discussion, like if this dimension here let's say that's six inches, this dimension wouldn't be three. It might be, I don't know, like 1.72. You know, it might be something weird, okay? You know, just look up an L six by six by whatever, and the dimensions might be different. So what we might do from a welding standpoint is we might place a bunch of weld on this side, But on this side, only place a little bit. The idea, the, the analogy is again, okay, imagine if I had a beam and I put a load right here and you know put some dimensions on this. This is six inches and this is 1.72. I'm just curious. Anybody who remembers structural analysis, I know the guy who taught that, um, if this is RA and this is RB, what is RA in this scenario? Let's see if anybody can do that quickly for me for this problem. Like what would RA and RB be in this instance? It is a moment equation, you're exactly right. So however you wanna do this, it doesn't matter. Like you can you know, set moments, do that, you know, all that stuff. Somebody help me out with this. What's RA? than RB. It's some percentage of P, right?
I know you can do this. Come on. I believe in you. It doesn't matter. Just set it equal to one. It doesn't matter. So RA, you're getting 28.6% uh, of P and whatever the difference is, 100 minus 28.6. Zero point seven one or seventy one point three percent of P. So here here's what you would do. Let's say you computed that, you know, for for this angle, let's say you computed that, you know, you need LW is, I don't know, twenty three point, you know, six inches of well, right? We'll put seventy one point three percent of it here and put 28.6% of it there. So, and the reason that you do that is so that by laying the weld out that way, when you yank out on the angle, you're eliminating bending in the angle. That's the whole point. We don't have to worry about that on a plate because we know where the load's lying. Just put half on one side, half on the other, and it's simple. But whenever the centroid is knocked off from the middle, we might place more load on the side that's closest to the centroid because the centroid is all the way like over here. This is called weld balancing. This is a balanced weld arrangement, placing more weld on, you know, one side because the centroid's over on one side. All right, yeah, 71.3. Actually, I guess if you rounded this one, this one would be 28.7. It doesn't matter. That's close enough. Because you're, you're going to end up calculating those um, you're going to end up calculating those weld lengths and then rounding it to the nearest inch anyways. So yeah, you might have an angle that might have like 11 inches of weld on one side and only four on the other. They do that because, it, you know, if you have that angle and it's being loaded, unloaded, loaded, unloaded, then this helps reduce some of the, you know, other stresses by eliminating bending. It's called a balanced weld. Anybody have any questions on that? I, it's just, you know, food for thought. I checked them, they were. You were right. Yeah, you're right. Which, by the way, I got you, this side note. I got your email. I want to chat with you about that later, but I, I did get it. I'm talking to Mr. Romans. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Not in this class, but here's the thing. The So fillet welds are the most common type of, of weld in structural engineering. Second most common type are going to be groove welds. Now, if you open the manual, and you don't even have to take my word for it, if you open the manual and go to table J2.5 and look at the spec on weld, um, look what it says for groove welds. Like, for instance, complete joint penetration groove welds. Okay? So I'm on table, let me turn my webcam on. So I'm on table two, uh, J2.5, uh, you know, that big table that went across two pages, and I'm on... Um, 
Uh, I'm on page 16.1-123. Now, CJP welds are very common when you're constructing plate girders when you are splicing two plates together. Very common, CJP and PJP welds. Uh, the others, as, as Mr. Blizzard, are, are, are not as common in structures. Fillet welds and groove welds are by and large the most common. But if you look at, for example, CJP welds, you all you've got to do is just match filler metals and the strength of the joints controlled by the base metal. There's not really any design because you're just welding it and, and machining it and fabricating it such that it's that the base metal is governing and you really don't have to do any math. It's not like for fillet welds where you've got, you know, all this, this math you've got to do. So it, it's just, I mean, are there other welds used? Yeah, but it's not... There's not a whole lot to them. Now, PJP welds are a little different. They got a little bit more going on, but um, but again, CJP and, and fillet welds are, are the most common. We're not gonna worry about anything else in CE 414 if, if that's another question. This is all we're worrying about in here. Any questions? Any other questions? He's right. You're you're right, Mr. Blizzard. I mean, and, and I mean, like I said, fillet welds are like 90, 80 to 90%, maybe not even a little bit more, 80 to 90% of what we do in, in structural engineering. I don't know that I've even ever reviewed a, a project at least a modern project where like a plug and slot weld was really used. Nothing recently at least. You will, it comes with practice, comes with time, but you will. We got some really cool stuff we're gonna talk about with columns and beams too, like what shapes are used and how they're done. I can't imagine you did a lot of plug and slot welds in buildings and bridges. Maybe for some, you know, m minor detail stuff, but not for anything big. Any other questions? All right. Looks like we're ending a couple minutes early. So Wednesday, just to make sure everybody's clear on housekeeping, Wednesday we're gonna do exam review. Um, I might get here a couple minutes late because of capstone presentations. This, this guy, this guy, <laughs> look at this guy with the jokes. <laughs> um. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, let, on Wednesday, like I said, Wednesday we're going to do the review, but we're not going to do the exam until the following Monday. And then when we come back, we enter a whole new world of bridge, of steel design uh, because we start getting into a new topic, which is going to monopolize the rest of the semester. And that topic is stability because columns and beams, I, I know, I know, uh, columns and beams are all, um, functions of buckling like buckling is the the um uh the the uh, the land of, of column and beam design uh maybe a lot maybe a little i <laughs> i don't know mr adkins but that's all i've got everybody uh, i'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording i will see you all on wednesday uh and i'll get this homework 4.2 loaded soon that's all i got everybody